they're related questions, obviously. One is, when you open your eyes, you see the world. And so the first question is, why? Why is it that you see the world and you have that experience of seeing? The second is, given that you see the world, how do you talk about it? These, both of these are our every, so they are sort of constitutive of our everyday experience, right? So our conscious experience of the world depends on us experiencing the world as something that is made available to us through our senses. If we were computers, so there are two deep issues here. One is, why do you see anything at all? And the second is, why do you see it in the particular way that you see it? So the why do you see anything at all is the problem of qualia. Right? So why is it that you experience the world rather than just um, somehow blindly acting in it? So a mechanical entity which was just receiving stimuli and processing it computationally or however physically and then responding to the stimulus, nowhere in this loop is the need for experience. You could be completely unconscious, like the, in fact the automata that the French uh, king used to uh, entertain in his garden. There's no difference between you and that automata, which is why the zombie idea keeps recurring in both in uh, philosophy as well as in popular culture, right? Because deep down we are uh, conscious, so it's all not conscious, we deep down we are aware of the fact that there's nothing in our modern scientific account of the world that necessitates consciousness and experience. It, it's either an unexplained mystery or it's an epiphenomena, which is to say it's really besides the main narrative of biology that we are evolved machines. Or even worse, it doesn't exist. It's sort of hard to imagine how somebody could try to sustain that argument that we are not conscious um, in the most cutting, I think, response to that is, you are not conscious, because I certainly am. <laughs> uh, and uh, nevertheless, there are people who think consciousness either doesn't exist, or if it exists, it is really some afterthought, or <coughs> it's a mystery, because it doesn't fit naturally into a picture of the world of experience. I mean, of uh, the uh, world as revealed by science. Now, if that was the case, and most of us were just everyday neuroscientists, so we don't care. So we study the brain like we study the pancreas. And the fact of the matter is, most neuroscience is like that. When you go into a lab and you do neuroscience, it frankly doesn't matter what kind of piece of flesh is in front of you. As far as you are concerned, you're poking it with some needle and you're taking measurements. Those measurements are being amplified by some meter somewhere and you are processing that signal. It really could be anything at all, right? Many of the statistical techniques you use are anyway the same as other signal processing entities. So how does it matter whether it was the brain or the bank? But, nevertheless, going back to the study of computation, why did computation make such a big impact on the study of the mind? It's because in this practical sense, you know, you see a piece of flesh in front of you, you're taking various recordings, so imagine, you know, you have 128 channels, so you're getting, uh, now you're even getting to 256 channels, so imagine a 256 channels of, you know, so a 256 dimensional space of signals and you do signal processing on it. But what does that really mean? How, how do you take this piece of flesh in front of you and even figure out is it seeing or hearing or laughing or, you know, making, you know, jokes? Is it sleeping? There's nothing in the signal itself 
that tells you what that entity is doing. And the fact of the matter is, even the roboticist or the mechanical engineer wants to know what this thing is doing. Just the signal by itself is not interesting. It's the fact that you're seeing or hearing that makes it interesting. So how do you make that link between the activity that you measure and the function of the entity? Computation and that very top-down approach, which I mentioned that Mark pioneered, is a first step towards getting to what is this thing really doing. You first make a computational theory. The computational theory tells you, oh, my sense is depth perception has to be solved by this entity because it's behaving as if it is able to perceive depth. Then you ask, of course, how is that implemented in the brain? So once you admit to that perspective that a computational function like a perception is part and parcel of describing this entity, what's stopping you from taking the next step? Saying it's not just depth perception, it's depth experience that you should be studying. Okay? Except that we don't have a good language for studying experience. Computation, the great thing is that it gave us a very precise language for studying mechanical processes that nevertheless mimic information processing. Right? But experience, if you want to study, what is the language of the study of experience? Um, one answer to that, and that's where body cognition to some extent gets a lot of its energy from intellectual energy, is phenomenology. Now, what I mean is the academic philosophical discipline of phenomenology. One of the claims that phenomenologists make is we should pay very, very careful attention to experience. Right? So it's not as if experience is unstructured. So what the computationists are saying is experience is too messy, or even if it is structured, I can't really get to it. I'm just going to abstract away the messy features and say this is just a geometric problem of getting 3D shape from 2D images. Or this is a uh, grammar, formal grammar problem of extracting uh, a finite state automata out of auditory signals. But phenomenologists uh, would say that's going too fast. So that's fast thinking. We are converting a problem from its experiential basis to its a computational problem too quickly. Instead, let's stop and pay careful attention to how the phenomena itself appears. To give you an example, you take any object, and Gestalt is again ahead of all of us in this. Right? So even though they were not phenomenologists, they were phenomenologists in practice, even if they were not academic phenomenologists. Right? Of course, they were all in Germany at around the same time, so I'm sure they knew of each other's work. So if I'm looking at that lectern over there, it appears to me in a certain way, right? So the view of the lectern gives me two things. One, it tells me that it's an approximately um, cubical, cuboid-shaped entity whose height is greater than the other two dimensions. But I also get a sense for what is hidden from me, right? So the way it appears to me is of a solid entity which has a hidden aspect which I can nevertheless reveal by walking over here, right? So that careful attention to the phenomenology which is how do objects present themselves to us? Objects actually don't present themselves to us as fully formed 3D models. So, the Cartesian or Mar idea that you are extracting 3D models from two 2D images is actually not how you experience the world. You experience the world as only partly 3D. That is to say, what is revealed to you as a view in front of your eyes is three-dimensional, but much of it is also hidden to you. And that's how the whole world always, always appears to you in front of your eyes. So if that is a serious input. So any account of computation then, which says, I actually want to model the actual experience of seeing rather than uh, abstracted experience of seeing, will have to tell me how is it 
that I, I on the one hand am aware of what is immediately available to me, but I'm also aware of what is not available to me. So the backside of that entity, which is not available, should be part of my theory, just as the front side of it. The Gestalt is basically part of all this, right? So in their exper experiments about what's called a model completion. So for example, I have my one hand with this marker blocking parts of the second hand. And all of you see it as a hand behind a marker. You don't see it as a broken up hand with a marker in front of it. It's you're seeing, you're not actually thinking, it's not like you reason and say, oh, your hand is continuous and your arm is in front, so your hand must actually continue behind your arm. You see it as one entity behind another. So that's what I'm saying. It's the experience of the seeing having a quality that's important. So how do you theorize this capacity of your visual system to see the world in a certain way? That's sort of a pre-computational problem. And the phenomenologists are saying, let's actually spend some time describing this experience. And of course, just like in computation, it's not easy to do that. We are not trained to observe our own experience. For the most part, you just are doing various things, and the amount of focus you have on any single thing is too little to make that aspect sort of come to the front. Right? I mean, and just as solving math problems is hard, so being able to convert an ex a problem from sort of a statement in words to a geometric problem is a very hard skill. And it takes many, many years of knowing how to geometrize a problem that it becomes obvious that yes, vision is converting 2D images into 3D problems. It's, I mean, 500 years ago, it wouldn't have been obvious to people that this is what the problem of vision is. It took the development of perspective, which you know, which was pioneered by Italian artists, plus the development of coordinate geometry that Descartes did. I mean, so there is a huge amount of cultural learning that goes before it becomes obvious that oh yeah, this is a geometry problem. Okay, so in before, so if you go back 600 years, it's, and you said you have to cultivate something. You have to cultivate both the capacity to pay strong attention to your experience and the capacity to formalize it geometrically. It might have turned out that we have a very, very different idea of how the mind works than what we have now. Because we would have discovered as many things about phenomenology as we have about geometry and uh, uh, algebra. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. So we are stuck in a situation where one branch of the sciences, so phenomenology, by incidentally, Husserl who invents phenomenology as, a, as an academic discipline, thinks of it as a science, right? So this, it was the science that would lend a scientific basis to epistemology in exactly the way that, say, mathematics and logic give a basis to the hard natural sciences like physics. Right? So his idea was that epistemology and philosophy in general should be grounded in a technique which is as reliable as uh, mathematics is. It's a very Cartesian idea because like, what is Descartes says? He says that mathematics is the most reliable thing, but what is the single most certain thing? It is my own experience. So a science of experience, even by its own inventor, would be as reliable as anything you can potentially imagine. So, Pessler takes that seriously and says, let's produce a science of experience. But that requires a very trained view of how objects appear to you, how they disappear to you. Um, and in the absence of smoking pot or some other drug, it's very hard for us to really, really pay attention to that, right? I mean, let's put it this way that at some point, and it's not again a surprise that religious traditions across the world smoke uh, drugs. The reason is because it does. It slows down experience in a way that it allows you to grasp it. Otherwise, experience goes by too fast for us to, to really catch hold of it. 
But when you have smoked a couple of joints, uh, yeah, and different people, of course, react to it in different ways. If you are conscious of that we are experiencing, we can go there Because we are conscious Not necessarily, right? I mean, that is, of course, the further claim. I mean, just because I'm conscious of the redness of the red in front of me, I can't make it into blue. I mean, it depends on what you mean by control. I mean, I can't like, I can't do whatever I feel like to it. I can do something. So, for example, I may be able to use the consciousness of red to really see if it's this red rather than that red. But I can't convert red into blue. Okay. So, it's it's the it's not an alchemy. philosophy that happened in the 50s and 60s, try to analyze 
such things because we just very loosely use terms like the computer made an error or the you know uh, the train was late now that sort of attributes agency and mentality to something that perhaps doesn't have it and and so one possibility is we should simply stop using those terms as say i should not say that the computer made a mistake you can say that the computer algorithm misfired okay so that that distinguishes what an agent would do from what a computer would do the other direction you could go is that we ourselves are automatons and therefore you start stop describing humans as things that make mistakes and just say that my brain misfired but but either way i think that eventually whether we are genuinely non mechanical beings or not there is a distinction there to be done like what can you justify me attribute to a genuine agent and what can you attribute to a machine or to be really entirely different things so if we are actually machines of a certain kind then you can should stop attributing agency and moral responsibility onto us and if we are uh, not machines then we should stop at least in certain kinds of discourse like in an academic situation we should stop talking about computers and machines as it is okay it's very hard for us to do because the way our minds work is that we attribute agency to anything that we can so <laughs> 